New Growth, Osby, and with support from the SBA, are teaming up to build the pipeline of bankable businesses in this rural region. Um, and uh, we're really excited about the opportunity to work together and kind of address some needs. Um, we've introduced Lisa and myself. I've been with New Growth for the past five years, and Sheridan who was going to be join us, joining us today, but she got exposed to COVID and couldn't make it in person. So she sends oh, her, no. her greetings to everyone. Well, hopefully she doesn't get it, but we didn't want to infect anybody else. Um, this is just a quick review of what we're going to be doing. Again, we're focused on the low-income, limited resource entrepreneur that doesn't uh, have access uh, to capital or much business capacity, um, working together on training as well as credit building and microfinancing. Our project started in October, and we expect this to continue as we're building capacity together. Uh, we will be putting out a, a job opportunity uh, here in the next couple of weeks or even this next week. So appreciate your help sharing that. Um, we are focused on these six uh, uh, persistent poverty counties in the region, but also Douglas is part of the part of that area and we want to reach out to them as well. Um, what we have set up with Osby is that we will uh, work with them to address those that they are unable to serve with their microfinancing business, their work right now. And that's people with less than 600 credit score or that need amounts less than $5,000. So we're teaming up to hand off to each other, you know, who's the most appropriate client for whom. And that's where new growth will be focusing during this project. Um, so yeah, teaming up together and with all of you to, to do this. And we want to really see some results here in the next little bit. Um, again, there's three things we're going to be doing, and the first one is technical assistance, building that capacity. We'll be having some workshops, and this is kind of uh, an intro to the first section of kind of Lisa's introduction of how credit building really builds up um, an entrepreneur's capacity, or even an individual, even if they're just dreaming of a business, how they need to do this first. I'm going to hand it off to you, Lisa, here. Sure. So um, as Patty mentioned, this, this project is really um, focused on getting people into our system of technical assistance and then um, SBA lending and then traditional bank lending and just growing um, community wealth through starting with some of the lowest credit scores and what we would call the some of the uh, more unusual suspects. So um, this continuum shows typically how small businesses are funded. I do wanna add a caveat that this is not tech related businesses. They have a completely different growth continuum, um, but we're not talking about tech businesses today in general. So um, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother ball of wax. So, um, Typically, uh, folks are able to start their small business, and we're talking any type of business. So this could be a side gig. This could be a part-time job. It could be agriculture. It could be manufacturing, a storefront, um, and the list goes on and on. So um, typically, either they've saved some money back or they have some money in an in a, um, investment account or a retirement account that they can pull out. Maybe friends and family are putting some money in and then um, just typically utilizing like bootstrapping techniques. Maybe um, you find a great spot at Osby and you're able to get really affordable office space, things like that. So that's that first level of kind of funding ideas. Then um, where we kind of fit in this continuum is... Um, if you see at one of the lowest points of business, is that less than a hundred thousand? So um, that's where accelerators, grant programs, um, and microloans and revolving loan funds kind of come in. Um, we would like to, through the SBA Prime Grant, we've kind of looked at separating this down even more. Um, because what we know is that um, there's a big difference between a five hundred dollar loan and a $100,000 loan. So lumping those all together creates um, creates a lot of room for variance. So with the prime grant, we're really looking at the lowest part of that um, 
of that amount. So the um, up to $5,000 loans that right now um, are really hard to finance. Um, by the way, um, if we have bankers in the room, um, it costs the same. Basically, uh, I just read this on Bankrate, but it costs the same to um, put together a $100,000 loan as it costs to put together a million dollar loan, but you can see why it's less less fun to do that. Uh, it's less of a money maker. So the micro lending programs like New Growth and Osby are typically not using loans as um, a source of income, but it's a tool to help um, entre entrepreneurs grow. So by separating out that lower amount, um, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is kind of up to 50,000. Um, we are not going to address angel investors, um, venture capital, or any of those larger amounts today. I'm going to go to the next slide, Patty, please. So credit building is a big part of that. What we know is in rural communities, um, we don't have the option of saying no to a business uh, just because they have a poor credit score. A lot of times our small, our small communities, we need those businesses um, so we don't have to drive two hours to um, Springfield to get something or we have to wait um, several days to get um, our plumbing fixed in our business because there's only one plumber in the town um, and he's too busy or there was going to be a plumber but he had a low credit score so he couldn't get his business financed. So by um, not allowing those entrepreneurs to kind of fully develop starting with a credit score, um, we're actually taking services away from our communities that are needed and that help lower the cost of goods and services. Um, so by having a good credit score, obviously a lot of pluses, um, less likely to be involved in predatory lending or payday scams, more opportunities to build long-term assets like home, business, higher education, and then more affordable rates um, and safer products. Um, and then uh, kind of a factor that people don't think about a lower credit score um, in Missouri still affects your car insurance. It affects sometimes access to employment, um, how much you pay on deposits, things like that. Next slide. So this is the information that we, we pulled down from Prosperity Now. I was guessing when we were looking at it that it was probably information that Osby has Prosperity Now. So um, it may be a little bit of preaching to the choir. But these are just some regional demographics that you're serving. Um, persistent poverty counties are a hot topic nationwide. I was in New York a couple weeks ago at the OFN conference. Um, they were talking about persistent poverty in great detail. Um, kind of the, the thought process that, you know, these are struggling. Um, I know when I was with the SBA, for example, he's in the state that hadn't had an SBA loan. So, um, trying to get more dollars into those markets oh, and uh, and be able to, um, again, start with the lowest and then develop them on up the pipeline to be bankable borrowers. And I think we lost our slide, Patty. Yeah, we are working on trying to get better internet here, but I will get back to that. Hold on a second. Okay. Lisa, it broke up a little bit um, on us while you were on the last one. Mm -hmm. Patty, it might not even be your connection. It might be Lisa's. Yeah. How's your connection, Lisa? It's not great. I'm in, I'm I in, think that's what it is because it's okay. in the that's woods in the, the middle of Washington. Washington. <laughs> okay. So I think, yeah, that's the way it sounded like to me. It's, it's All right. I apologize. Anything that you need me to repeat, I'm happy to do so. And uh, 
So I wasn't paying attention, but do we need to go to the next slide or do you have more to say on this one? Can, yeah, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, was there a question? question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you just talk a little bit about the child poverty and what that actually means a little bit more? I mean, I see the number there, but it's kind of a rough number. The child poverty zero to five. Is that the age? Yes, I that's put that a, in there. That's zero children zero to five. That's the rate of so like 40% of the children that are zero to five years old in those counties are experiencing poverty. Mm -hmm, that's correct. They're born into poverty, most likely. And um, uh, if, if you look at, if you look at how our, our in there. yeah, our top, um, our top billionaires, um, maybe trillionaires at this point, not born into poverty. Um, that uh, you can be anything you want to be is is um, only relevant if you have resources available to you to become something else. The Elon Musks and uh, Mark Zuckerbergs of the world had financial backing from family members and and uh, friends, and that 42.3 percent born into poverty most likely are not going to have those types of resources. How does the 20% compare to the nation? I think the nation's just a little bit lower than Missouri. I just wrote that for mm -hmm. Is but, but to oh. make all of those statistics even more important and looking much worse, keep in mind that Missouri has implemented a statewide minimum wage that has almost doubled the federal minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So that has increased the income of many of our families, the, the gross income. So federal but, minimum wage is what, $9 now? It's seven, well, it'd be $12 January 1 for and, the state minimum wage. And what's the federal? Uh, what's the state is $12? The yeah. is and the federal is like six seventy five or seven seven seventy five, I think. Yeah. Um, but but as, as many of these families' income has increased, for the federal poverty limit is not. It's based on seven fifty an hour. Oh, I didn't realize that. Huh. So, so we're not keeping up there. But then, as many of these families have gained some income, they lose benefits. Their eligibility for food stamps went yeah. out the window. Yeah. Their yeah. eligibility for subsidized housing costs has either right. decreased or disappeared. Right. And many of them are in worse shape today than they were making. 750 an hour is qualifying for benefits. Yeah, no, I. So, so these numbers are somewhat misleading mm -hmm. in, in, in the wrong way. Hmm. So you would say it's even higher. It's, it's even higher. If you yeah. I would agree. A lot of desperation, too, and out of that, right? The yeah. cliff effect. Mm -hmm. Thanks for adding that. That's and in fact, we have a new cliff tool available for our workforce development program that that can factor that in. So for instance, a student looking at going from being a, a certified nurse's aide and thinking about maybe becoming an LPN or an RN, or we can factor in over the years, the increases in income for the expense of all the trainings and education, but also as they lose eligibility. I mean, you know, if, if they've got kids in school, as their their free and reduced lunches slowly disappear and their food stamps decrease. And, and in some cases, I mean, it proves that stopping at LPN is actually better for that person long-term than going on to RN in that they're not gonna live long enough to pay it off. Wow. And looking at, so basically what he's talking about is that we should be looking at the living wage that's needed, not the minimum wage um, and that living wage will show us what, you know, what amount is needed to get them health insurance. That's a big one. Um, when we look at credit reports today, you'll see that and, and um, replace those other benefits because those benefits programs aren't meant to last forever. Um, and, and a lot of them have um, points where they age out or they are no longer eligible. So we want to keep, we want to support people to move move beyond those if we possibly can. Yeah. And I guess to summarize, the credit score is a key part, whether it's insurance rate or employment or whatever. It's just one of those tools that can have a, a big effect 
in helping people sure. navigate that. Mm -hmm. So what, what we know too is in rural households, typically um, transportation takes about 30% of a household budget. That includes three things. That includes, um, that includes the cost of the vehicle that you're driving. Uh, and you know that if you have a better credit score, then um, we have a slide that talks about how much you can save. Um, it also affects your car insurance. So a better credit score makes your car insurance cost less. And then the third thing is the cost of fuel. And there's very little that we can do to affect that. So, yeah. All right, Patty. So uh, again, so, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so we're, look, we're looking at uh, this program to kind of funnel folks in at a beginning spot and then grow them through a continuum uh, to get them to bank lending and being small business owners, um, productive individuals in the community. And we know that small business owners are the ones supporting our 4-H uh, and Boy Scouts and school efforts and um, working, with our, um, working with our community foundations, working with our chambers of commerce. So there's a lot of value up these entrepreneurs in our community. So we're looking at non-bankable borrowers. So the, the first thing I wanna point out is that this program is not for people who are eligible for a loan now at a bank. Um, or eligible maybe for like a SBA 504 or 7A product. Um, mm. These are folks that are that are steps um, before they would be ready for that program. Uh, so they're typically a low or no credit score. Um, they're a startup business and they're lacking that two years of financials that um, that uh, the FDIC and some Federal Reserve Bank regulations like them to have, and then they're um, lacking re repayment ability. Um, we're talking about very tight budget, 42% um, in poverty. We've already went over how those numbers are very low and just not able to sustain basic needs. So um, how are we going to make an entrepreneur out of someone who can't keep food in the fridge? And that's kind of the, the starting point. That's why credit is a great uh, tool to implement here because it's at little or no cost at all to those households. Next slide. Did I skip one before that? No, okay, there we go. So we're um, gonna talk today about credit building loans and microloans again in, these, in this continuum. Um, we're we're not going to um, talk about SBA loans, bank financing, or venture capital or angel investors, except to say that we want to build a a um, group of people that would be eligible to receive these type of products within uh, the next six months to two years. Already in your community, Osby is offering a wonderful loan product. It's um, $5,000 to $50,000 with an interest rate of 6.25 in really reasonable terms, uh, going up to 10 years, um, no payment for early penalty, and they are looking for a 600 minimum credit score. So looking to get people up to that point so they can utilize this great product that you already have in your community. Next they, slide. We just, we just follow Prime, so that's changed. Yeah. Okay. Changed, which, what is it, seven now or seven? Seven now, yeah. We'll see okay. tomorrow or <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. That's, that's still a very I reasonable rate. Now. Yeah, I think the average rate of a payday lender in Missouri um, is somewhere between 400 and 500 percent now. I'm not sure. I haven't checked it in the last month or so, but uh, much higher than seven. Yes. <laughs> um, the next product I want to talk about is the giving yourself credit. 
are these loans are specifically designed for individuals who have um, invisible credit, their credit goes, or they have what we call a thin file. Um, this basically means they either have no credit at all, they have no active lines, or maybe they only have uh, some collection debt, nothing is moving on their credit report, and so that's holding their score down very low. Um, they, with this product, we're able to create two active lines of credit, an installment line and a revolving line with one $500 loan. So 300 of that would go to a secured credit card. Um, it's not a prepaid card, it's a secured card, so it works just like other credit cards. You put something on there, then you pay it back down. Uh, we're encouraging people never to put more than $100 on that secured card and then pay it off to think of it as a credit building card instead of a, hey, I'd like to go crazy and buy my kids the greatest new toy on the market this Christmas card. Um, that card is by creating the two active lines, we're able to move someone with no credit score up in the 600s, typically in six to nine months. Um, while this is a new product for new growth, this is not a new product in the um, community development financial institution world, the CDFI world. Um, this is a product that's used all over the United States. Uh, it's been tried and true um, and has been, it's been around for probably 15 years now and we've seen it work. Um, we have a gentleman that we're working with out here in Washington in three months time uh, we took his credit score from in the 500s to in the 600s. He had an 82 point increase in just a few months. So it works. It's not a um, repair scam. That's something that works short term to raise the score and then the score drops again when everything else goes back on. So it is a solid product that they can build on going forward. Next slide, Patty. And then um, New Growth also does larger loans uh, for those who are unable to secure bank financing or self-finance. Um, for the purpose of the prime grant and in your area, um, New Growth will be focusing on loans under 5,000 or in individuals that have applied um, with OSBI and have are not a fit for that program, but might be able to get a smaller dollar amount while they get their things in order to qualify for that larger loan. Um, there's no minimum score and the credit building is a part of this loan as well. And the thing I love about New Growth and OSBI working together is that both organizations are not saying, here's a check, good luck, hope your business works out well. Um, they're really creating a partnership with the individuals to help their business grow at the same time they're applying capital. And there are numerous reports that show that this is, that that perfect balance of technical assistance and capital is what makes businesses not just grow, but grow faster. Um, typically a business receiving technical assistance with the capital versus someone just receiving the capital is gonna grow at a rate three times faster and that's a national statistic. So um, I think you guys have a great combination going here that will that will work. Next slide. And then we're back to this continuum. So just kind of showing how we're going to start these people with a very low credit score. And um, for each stage, there's a part for everyone to play. We're, we're moving them towards bankers. So um, if, if banks receive applications for people that they can't serve, they can refer back to us. And then we're pushing people forward to get to them. So um, it's a community working together, catching an entrepreneur in what we call no entrepreneur left behind. Um, this allows an entrepreneur to enter where they, where they fit and then to grow forward. So traditionally, um, banks will lend to the five C's of credit. Um, and I'm sure this is a review for most people in the room. If you want to go to the next slide. 
They're looking at a combination of character, capacity, capital, conditions, and collateral. Um, so while the credit score is a factor, they're also looking at a credit report as basically a financial resume of where you've been, what you've been doing, and how you paid people back. Um, and they typically use the credit report as a measure of character, um, and, and it is one piece to the puzzle. They're also looking for skin in the game through collateral, and that's a factor that we're not going to consider in the micro lending. Um, and then conditions, um, we, as far as conditions for banks, right now is a weird time for micro lenders because we try to keep our rates not as good as the bank. Um, we want it to be, you know, that people grow into that bank lending and, it, and it's priced accordingly. But with the increases in prime, some some uh, micro lenders are kind of struggling to catch up uh, to that higher rate. So um, most rates are still fairly low. You want to go to the next slide. So when we're looking at micro lending, we've got a poll. Uh, we're looking at micro lending. We only use two of those five C's. So if you want to take a few minutes and weigh in on what two C's you feel like um, are base are the basis for micro lending. And we can I'll take votes here. We'll have some from people online. <clears throat> I but, just want to copy off of you. Okay. <laughs> that, that's not allowed. <laughs> Can I go start around the room? Terry, what do you think the first, the, the main ones are? I'm going to guess character and conditions. Character and conditions, okay. Character and capacity. Character and capacity, one vote each. I'm going with character and capacity as well. Two votes. All right. How about you? Capacity and character. All right. No? Uh, I'm going to have to stay with that. Okay. Okay. Character and conditions. Character and conditions. Okay, we got two for that. All right. And then we've also got conditions and collateral has one vote. I think that's all. Okay. So uh, the most votes were character and capacity, but also character and conditions. And uh, is that on that one? What was that? Yeah. And collateral. Okay. Lisa, talk to us. Okay. Okay. So all of those who said character and capacity are right on the money. We're looking at, and we're also using in micro lending the credit report uh, to tell us how, what kind of payment history they've had. But we're also doing, um, we have the luxury as micro lenders, since we're doing technical assistance and coaching with these clients to really get more of the story to find out, you know, um, uh, there's a series of medical debt, but it's all within a two month time period. Oh, that's when I had a car accident. Uh, so we're getting more to the story. And then uh, we are looking at smaller amounts. So we're able to lend without a collateral guarantee. Um, the reality of micro lending is a lot of times when we're securing collateral, on a $5,000 loan, it's going to cost us more to repo the $5,000 car than we probably can sell it for once we get it back. So um, we're doing more of, um, I know relationship lending is a big buzzword right now, but um, we really are doing that relationship lending to get the full story. And then we're really looking at capacity and we're basing this on a household budget versus a business budget. Because if a loan fails, and that happens sometimes, we know that a lot of small businesses fail. Be the individual to be able to still make the loan payment and work on their credit, even though their business may not have gone as successfully as they wanted. If you think about the entrepreneurs in your community that are successful now, you may be able to think of numerous businesses that they worked on or were a part of. So really trying to um, focus on, do they have the capacity to pay the loan back? The reason this is so important, the reason it's not a grant program is because 
we make a loan to business A, they pay that back when their first payment comes in. Hopefully we roll that with some other dollars and it goes out to business number two. So it's community loan fund um, and their payment is actually helping their neighbor build their business as well. Patty, you wanna go to the next slide? Um, this is a, this is kind of, I call my dream slide, um, working on a 700 square region. Uh, this is something that's been tried in different places. Some have been successful, some not as much, but really focusing on how strong your community would be, um, if everyone were able to have access to a 700 credit score. Um, Kind of some things that we are using and that we'll, we'll get ready to delve into big here is the um, our credit building tools, the loans that I mentioned, as well as individual credit action plans and then credit building workshops where um, we're, we're sharing information with a big group of people with the hope that they will come in um, based on their interests for more one-on-one -on -one and, and deep dive into their credit. But our goal with this project is to assess at least 100 people, at least know what their credit score is and what they can do to change it, and then having improvement in at least 25 individuals' credit scores. Okay, and these are some smiling faces of people that already built their credit score an amazing amount and got their business open um, with the assistance of microfinancing. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go hard into credit here. Finally, huh? Um, if you think the credit score doesn't make a difference, you have an excellent credit score right, right now. A six eighty is a great score when you're at the bank. Um, you can you right now probably can't get a five percent loan because of Prime, but you could get pretty close. And your monthly car payment on a ten thousand dollar car for five years would be one hundred and eighty nine dollars. Whereas if you have a not as good credit score and you need to go to John's pay here, buy here, get it today, um, your monthly payment could be $294 with a 25% interest rate. Not only are you putting $100 plus back into that household budget by having a better credit score because you've lowered that monthly payment, but if you look at the total interest paid over the five years time, with a poor credit score, that $10,000 car is going to cost you almost $18,000. And odds are good after five years, it's probably not going to have much value at all. Whereas with that really good credit score, your total interest paid is $6,300 less. That's a huge amount, especially to a low-income family. So you can see how the credit score is a really valuable tool in their finance um, toolbox. Next slide. So what really makes up a good credit score? Um, two things, your amount owed and versus your, um, your total credit limit and then your payment history. Something as simple as paying your um, credit card debt and your loan debt on time makes up 35% of your credit score. So one late pay could cost your credit score up to 100 points. Um, this is why we recommend with folks um, doing like a um, set up online pay. So a bill is paid on time for them every month as a part of their financing or trying to look at other ACH products, um, using schedules, making sure that it's not a day late, it's not a week late, but it's on time. And then um, your length of credit history is also important. We're gonna talk about how credit bureaus like long-term relationships versus one night stands. So um, trying to Show them that you're worthy of staying in this credit relationship long term and making good payment. Um, if you look at that pie, you do not see inquiries in there at all. Um, 
new credit does help your score, but um, the most an inquiry, I, I often have heard this in the past 15 years, it's not my fault. I have several credit inquiries and that's dropped my score like 200 points. No, it has not. It will drop your score 15 points and that's a maximum drop that you can see over inquiries. Um, another question is, um, or another thing that I've heard often is divorce is what has ruined my credit report. Um, while divorce does affect your credit in that it is a, um, often you are closing joint accounts. So that closing of accounts affects your length of credit history. It also affects your amounts owed because your, um, your ratio of how high your credit limit is and how much you have charged could be negatively affected in that. But um, one, those items go away after seven years. Um, and two, as you add in good lines, we will show how the good lines have more of a positive than um, the closings have a negative. So next slide, please. So this is a credit action plan. And um, kudos to Lakin or whoever made it so pretty. Um, it was not this pretty when I left, so I like it. Um, basically, this is a tool that we're using with credit building clients and um, we're, we're looking at their payment history, the amounts they owe, and then also their goal. The goal is important. Um, <clears throat> Building your credit is also not a goal. Um, <laughs> it is, but most people have other things that they're working on. Maybe they're working towards building or buying a home. Maybe they're an entrepreneur. Maybe they want to go back to school. Um, maybe they just want their bills to be less than their income each month. So um, that's where we're putting uh, goals, and then the action steps are what activity is going to take place, who's going to do it, and then what day we're going to actually get that done. So this is just a tool. It's a living document. So when we're meeting with clients, this is something we're going to pull out each time and say, okay, where are we at? Um, are we moving forward? Have we not got this done yet? You know, what barriers are standing in our way? Next slide. Hmm. It's not wanting to move on me. Oh, no, that means it's going to jump like three slides. Yeah. <laughs> huh. You hit escape. Let's see if I can get Oh, this. it just moved. Okay. Oh, yeah, there we go. Maybe go back. Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay. All right. So how do we move this score? First, they need to have at least three lines of credit on their credit report. Um. Those are good lines. So three collection debts won't work. It has to be an active line that they're making payments on each month and is not a closed account. So having those three lines, having a blend of installment and revolving credit is also very beneficial. That helps the score as well. Um, creditors like to, or um, lenders like to see that you're able to handle the same payment each month and pay something down, or you can handle a revolving account where your payment may change. Uh, super important to never have a balance greater than 30% of your credit limit. So if I have um, $5,000 worth of, of a credit limit on my three credit cards, I don't ever want to exceed around 1500 on those. Um, often when working with small businesses, I've had them say, oh, we use our credit card, we buy all our inventory for a month, and then we pay it off at the end of the month. Uh, but since we're paying it off, that doesn't hurt our credit, right? It really depends if you are able to break through the um, credit reporting algorithm to know when they're reporting. Um, if they change up their reporting times, it could show that you have a full balance, which will hurt your score. So again, I just recommend never having more than that 30%. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> not closing accounts is important. It doesn't mean you have to use those accounts all the time. Um, what I would recommend is 
you have um, a lot of credit cards is to put some away and kind of pick out your three that you're gonna use ongoing, but closing accounts, again, it affects your credit score um, because of the length of time that you have an account. So you wanna keep that average high and closing accounts drops that average. <laughs> Excuse me. And then of course, again, paying on time, super important. Next slide. Um, when I first came to Washington State with a new organization I'm working with, um, they were not trained in credit building and they were really focusing on how to pay off collection debt. Paying off debt um, is great if you are looking at getting a mortgage. Mortgage lenders want to see that you don't have any collection debt on your account. Um, if you're going to start a small business, small business lenders are less concerned with old debt. I don't encourage anyone to not be responsible for debts that they have incurred. However, if you are in a rough situation, you're trying to get back on your feet, paying off old collection debt is not going to change your situation in a credit report. It's merely going to um, drop some balances to zero, which will um, stop creditor calls from coming, but it won't actually change your score because it takes good active lines to move your score. So if you are looking at um, getting that old debt off of your credit report, um, make sure to start with having three good active lines first and then working on paying them off, which will talk a little bit about um, on the, I think the next slide. Okay, so I have some collection debt. I'm in a good place. I got a big tax refund. Um, it is most important that you save up lump sums to pay off collection debts. Never make a payment arrangement with an item that is already in collection on your credit report. Here's why. When a collection debt hits your credit report, it's like an asteroid. It shakes everything up, dust flies, there's fire, it's bad. Your score drops. However, after the dust settles, that collection debt is just sitting there. It's not doing new damage to you each month. It's done the damage it's going to do. If you set up a payment plan with a collection um, company, <laughs> with the best intentions, right? I want to pay my debt off. I don't want to owe you anymore, but I only have this much money. When you go into that payment method, um, I often will hear people say, I didn't see my score go up. My score actually went down. Uh, that's because your account's still in collection. And every time you make a payment, they can re-report that debt. So they're basically scratching the scab off and starting the bleeding all over again with that contact. So I highly recommend that when you have a lump sum uh, that you talk at that point with the creditors and typically they, most creditors, most will settle for around 50%. There are some folks that won't play. Um, if you owe SBA debt, there's no play. You owe that debt until you die or until the US, you know, um, the SBA, we have the U.S. Treasury as our collection agency, so they typically will get their money one way or another. Um, the same with student loan debt, um, and that's a whole nother thing, but um, just considering any student loan debt that you have right now that's not up for forgiveness, um, that debt will not go away. Um, items that have been taken to court and there's either a state or federal lien on your account will never go away and child support never goes away so those are items that you can't negotiate no can't negotiate on but you can save up and typically if child support is the issue um the child support folks are always open that is the one place i would say that a payment plan is an acceptable way because 
Typically, child support will put your loan in good standing if you have been in a payment plan for three months, and that's not typical of other creditors. Um, when you're making negotiations with your creditor, make sure you're getting that settlement in writing. Um, you don't want to agree to pay 50%, you pay the 50%, and then they put the other 50% right on your credit, and you have nothing, um, you don't have a leg to stand on without that in writing. Okay. Next slide. Um, by utilizing the financial coaches and um, the credit building staff, they can help you dispute inaccuracies on your credit report. We have copies of dispute letters that we can share with you. So um, you can do that as well. There's also locations online within Equifax and Experian and TransUnion where they can um, dispute any bad items. Um, <laughs> super important couple things. If anyone is in a program where they're paying someone to fix their credit, um, you need to work with them to see how they can get out of that contract because <clears throat> those are almost 100% of the time um, a scam and they, will, they do not change their credit. Um, and I'm not talking about like a um, I think some of the credit bureaus now and some of the credit card companies have where they can inch up your credit report. Oh, my credit report's up 20 points because they're now counting my electric bill, things like that. I'm not talking about those organizations. Um, uh, often they will they will be under like a legal heading and uh, say that they're fixing your credit, but really it's a process of disputing and and uh, moving of shells and it, it doesn't help in the long run. Um, also, if you're disputing, only dispute the inaccurate items on the credit report. Someone who has a lot of debt and they dispute every single item on their credit report, um, how many of you would feel that that was really a, um, that, that was accurate, that no negative item on their credit was theirs, right? Um, when you're looking at that credit report for lending, you're probably going to think, oh, they're trying to get out of paying debt that they owed by disputing all these items. So that that um, blanket disputing um, lenders are in tune to what, what is happening there, and it, it doesn't um, bode well towards uh, you trying to represent good character. So um, making sure that you only dispute the items that are actually incorrect and providing documentation um, to the credit bureaus to get that taken off. Um, merely sending a letter, there, um, there's myths that you send a letter and then um, they forget to respond to your letter in 30 days and they have to take it off. That happens very rarely. Um, your debt is your debt. So, so uh, dealing with it in an appropriate way. Next slide. Okay, so um, you may have this one out of order. Uh, okay. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. I think that's... Is that it? Is that... Okay, well, um, so we what I want to do... Yeah, you have a couple credit reports um, there, and hopefully they redacted. <laughs> yeah, these are redacted, the actual reports, and uh, people online have those by email. I sent them yesterday, but I'm going to hand these out. The first one, we'll look at report A. Sure. A for what? Apple? A for uh, Is it Awesome. Does A have the 468 credit score or the 594 credit score? It's the multi multi age oh, one. 468. Okay. Oh, you okay. Great. Thank you. So let's look at what's holding this score at a 468. Um, based on what we know, how many active lines do you all see on this credit report? A load of collections. <laughs> so active lines would not be under collections. 
right? Anyone have a guess? This is two. Yeah, I found two. Okay, what two did you find, Patty? Uh, an installment one, WFC, and an installment Sun Loan. Okay. So That's actually, the correct the correct answer is zero. Yeah. Um, both the Sun Loan and the um, okay, balance charged off. Yeah, I they're see. charged off. They're both so, closed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this Zero. individual only has negative. Oh. So when we talk about a credit building loan, at first, this credit report looks scary, right? One, just because of the sheer number of uh, accounts on here. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but we can also look at this credit report and see that the majority of these medical were include were incurred in about a year time frame, uh, between 9, 18 and, and um, uh, 2, 19, the majority of those uh, medical came on. So my guess, um, and I do know that client, so my guess uh, uh, would be with an educated guess is that a life event happened there. Um, where this individual did not have health insurance and had a serious medical problem. So that um, reflected on this credit report. Now, if you look at the two, you can say, well, what about the, the Sun loan and the other loan? They're during that same time period. And while medical debt's going on, what might also be happening? Can't work. Can't work, right? So got to figure out money somewhere. Um, so trying to access credit during um, during a situation like that is something you'll see fairly common on credit reports. So what would be a way to, what would be the first thing um, that you would advise with this customer to help their credit? Open up some good lines. Yay. Yay. So now the tricky part, how do we get him credit if he has poor credit, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's where, that's where this pro, this is where this prime program really um, makes a difference. So we're able to do like the give yourself credit loan um, because this is not probably, Heather, I would say it's safe to say this probably is not someone you would give a $25,000 loan to. Is that safe to say? <laughs> I don't think Isla would say that's a Isla question. <laughs> <laughs> However, if we could get this, get some active lines going, you know, we know that the medical collection is kind of tied to an event get some active lines going. This is a score that could actually be moved and we know it could because we did um, move this score about 125 points to the good within a nine month time frame. One active installment line and one revolving secured credit card line. So you got so, near 600? Yeah. So, it's good stuff. you know, I guess I'm kind of curious about the pipeline, Lisa, because so you improved their credit score. They've got $500. They want to be an entrepreneur. As, are you then looking at like the bridge loan, the $3,000 unsecured, or would New Growth actually look at them next for a 20? Would you consider them once they get to 600 for a $25,000 loan? Yes. So it would be a step up process and that's, it's even called a step up loan. So starting with a $500 credit builder loan, and then we see, oh, we have six months of on-time payments, plus working with um, SBDC, working with, you know, um, OSB, working with other organizations that are helping build that entrepreneurism. So at the same time we're moving the credit score, maybe they're working on a business plan. Um, uh, maybe they're ironing out financials. So 
there's a really um, during that time frame, it also gives them time to work on the business as well before it actually becomes a business. But then we can we can work them up the type line, a pipeline from a five hundred dollar loan, like you said, maybe it's a twenty five hundred dollar loan, right. and then in that time frame, now we can take to you at Osby and say. Now we have a gentleman that has a really great business plan, really solid financials, and 600 credit score plus we've got 12 to 18 months of on-time payments that we can show you for this individual. And we have the buy-in of them working with the entrepreneurial support. So we know it's not someone that's going to take the dollars and walk away and the business isn't going to fail. They already have that support team behind them when they're asking for the bigger dollar ask. I think, Lisa, the question that I've got when I look, and I, I know that this is just for illustration purposes, but it's really good. So there's also a bankruptcy on this one. So for me, um, I do know that like, Yes, the 16 to 18 months worth of payments are good. We brought the score up, but the bankruptcy is still there. And I know for me and our committee, it would be it would still be challenging. It would be tough for Heather and I to take this, take a $25,000 loan request to our committee with the bankruptcy. Yeah, I'm that is a dismissed bankruptcy. And I I think this one shows. Let me see that bankruptcy. It's right after all of the collections and right above the two. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it on this credit report either. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's it's a 13. So if, when a 13 is dismissed, that didn't mean they completed it, does it? That's what I'm saying. If it was a 13, well, it says paid in 814. Filed 514, yeah. paid in 814. And then results issued 331 21. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so did they complete the 13 or did they not? The, they, dis, they were able to get current, so they dismissed the 13. So that's why that collection debt, you're still seeing some of the collection debt on here because they didn't follow through with the, with the bankruptcy. Um, they dismissed. And that is a factor and we're completely, I, I do understand that. I think that's, that's a great um, lead into a discussion. Like we want to make sure that the folks we're working with at the beginning stages are able, if a bankruptcy is a, is a game changer, then that's something we want to recognize early. So we're not getting them all the way to you and then they hear no. Right. So I think, yeah. Well, yeah. and I think the other thing that we need to think outside the box, too, is, you know, we want a one-to-one -one collateral typically on our loan. Right. Um, so they've got the credit, so they can now enter the process. But, you know, can we or would we consider more equity and would we consider a step-up loan from them equity that could then help let, provide equity for our loan? Like, can we marry the two together to get people right. better financing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think that I, that's exactly what we want to do. And hopefully we're, we're developing some assets for them in this process. And through the coaching piece, they're um, finding other benefits. Um, I know we had a gentleman, um, the lending we do at Northwest Access Fund now is all to disabled communities. So there are some nuances um, along with that. But um, we had a low-income gentleman that wasn't using LIHEAP. Um, that's a that's a um, pretty standardized program across all community actions nationwide. But that um, that ability for them to buy, they bought eight hundred dollars worth of propane for him, and that offset eight hundred dollars in his budget. So he was able to do um, to put more in savings towards an asset. So doing that type of coaching along with the capital injection to get people where they would have some collateral to offer. And then, I mean, um, 
Patty could probably speak to this more than I could, but um, I would assume that new growth would, would um, I, I, kind of their model already through their loan policies is to assume that second or third position if needed. So I don't think that would be a big issue, would it, Patty? No, we often do that, you know, just to support. We want some collateral, but we'll, we'll subordinate most a lot of times mm -hmm. yeah. to get the financing. You've got to hear that he's going to get to that point too, right? So right. if he's, they yeah. start out with the first loan and then, you know, but he, hopefully he's talking to somebody and knows here's where you got to be in one year. Not only you have to make your payments, but you have to do X, whether it's accumulated collateral or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like building those assets and helping them know what they need to do to yeah. get there. Because mm -hmm. it's right. a little bit of a process. Mm -hmm. going to be important. We yeah. don't want to over promise, you know. Sure. Yeah, sure. Go through the process. Mm -hmm. And we have different criteria, like, you know, bankruptcy, you said, might just be a dead, you know, stop it right there. Whereas we might be able to work with them early on and then move them to you or, you know, however that goes. Yeah. 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 I know too that the bankruptcy would not um, would not hold them out. Unlike SBA microlending, there's no um, if it's not an active bankruptcy, if it's been discharged or dismissed, then an SBA microlend microloan um, would work for them as well. Mm -hmm. So if they weren't eligible for OSBE's programs, we might be able to fund them through like the SBA microlending or something as well. I'm having that meeting with all the microlenders. I believe I sent you an invite for the 20th. You can post that question again at the microlender meeting. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. I know that okay, so just to go back to the collateral thing, John's going to announce, maybe I'm taking his thunder, but they're going to put together, they're trying to put together a program where they can do up to $50,000 with no collateral. Who's that? Uh, Alt, yeah. Oh, Alt, Alt, yeah. We'll be at the meeting too, so. Okay, wow. Um, before we go on, Lisa, um, anybody online have a question or is, was everybody able to read the report easily? Any any people new to that that need any help with that? Just wanted to double check if there's any questions of, of kind of what we've been looking at, if anybody's not tracking. Right. Hearing none, I'll hand, no, am I hearing something? Nope. Okay. Back to you, Lisa. <laughs> okay. So let's look at our second credit report, the 594. Come on, Patty, yeah, catch up. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> okay. Number B. Correct. You can hand them this way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's more than you need. Okay. So this, this credit, credit score is only back. about 130 points better, but still mm -hmm. not at 600, right? Mm -hmm. So who wants to take a stab at why this credit score is a 594? What are some factors that may be holding it down? Yeah. Too thin. Right, we're missing active trade lines. There's just nothing here to sink your teeth into. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so they closed the King Liner. Yeah, they opened some credit and then they closed it. Right. Right. What other reason might be holding it down? I'm going to have one collection. Look at the balance on the central bank card. There's a credit limit of $1,000 and their balance is at $910. So they're utilizing 90% of their credit, which is uh, three times where we want them to be. Uh, we want that balance on that central bank card to never be above $300. And you can see where there is a good line there, but it is, <clears throat> it is holding the report down below 600 because of the overutilization. And also, to bankers in the room, what do you think when you're looking at someone whose credit cards are maxed to uh, 
the full amount? What do we what do we automatically kind of assume when we're lending to those individuals? They like to spend. <laughs> they like to spend, and that makes us nervous. Um, because there uh, may be a, a situation where there's some desperation. Mm -hmm. I've got one in my class. Tell the hamsters to turn the wheel a little faster. <laughs> so what would help this credit score? Well, they need more lines and they need less balance on their credit card. That's right. What's, when, what's a positive we can take from this credit report? The payment history on the one credit card that's open. You should work for the SBA or something. You're doing really good at this. Uh -huh. <laughs> I used to be a lender. That's right. That's right. So you're right. We've got somebody that's a payer. They just have, um, they just have a really high balance. So... Um, by adding in a couple lines and I mean the line that they did open the installment account it was only it looks like it was only open six months so again a short-term relationship that closed um so now that's a debt account doing no good and no bad for the credit report by by acting just adding just the two active lines um and this individual, I, I have the advantage to see in the future on these because they come from the past. This individual actually paid off his entire loan of, um, I think, t over, Patty, was it over 25000 Patty went to go get a cable. Okay. Yeah. So about um, paid off his loan in full within five months' time with successful business. We're having some technical challenges. Oh, we're about to run out of juice, so we needed to get the computer <laughs> Okay, we're back. All right, everything's good. I have a question. I just been looking at this. This is this is when I was out there. I don't know, what does this mean? So when it says late payments and it says under both central bank and fund loan, and then it says zero 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 five months, twenty two months. What is that? Is that telling me? What does that tell me? Tell you the 30, 60, 90. Right. They, had, they would have a one, two, or three underneath that would tell you how oh. 30, 60, 90. So they're good. Okay. Okay. They're good. Some credit reports will have no digit there if there were none, never any. This one just has a zero. Sometimes you'll see them where if yeah. they've got perfect, good payment history like this, they just won't see anything. They're all a little bit, we use Equifax, right? Mm -hmm. So it always looks different. They are. Okay. Commonly. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, I get that question a lot too. Why are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, my report and my score are different on all three? Um, because these are all entered by humans. And um, that's why the information isn't always the same. Because sometimes they'll, they may report to one bureau and not another. That'll change your score. And then there's always the potential for human error. There's also different ways, many different ways you can calculate that score. So exactly, if somebody says their credit score is this, doesn't mean that as a lender, when you pull their credit, that's what you're going to get. Right. And so they there are two kinds of credit scores, the FICO and the Vantage score. <clears throat> FICO's made a lot of money over holding kind of the secret recipe. And the, the credit card companies try and get close to what how FICO scores, but it is kind of still, um, they keep the details a secret and that way they can keep charging for them. We are a capitalist society, so. Any other questions? So those are just two reports, but um, both of those, even with the bankruptcy, you know, we're with with it being dismissed, that score was able to go up. Um, and I totally agree that credit is one piece of the puzzle. I think the premise, though, that if we can get people involved with 
<clears throat> seeking coaching for their business and their credit at the same time, that's going to make us a stronger line of potential borrowers down the road. Um, it may be that we're looking at doing credit building with 100 people. So it may be that of those, um, you know, 50% are not entrepreneurs. Still raising those credit scores in your community has a value. Uh, it's saving them money on the back end. They're able to do more purchasing um, on the front end, which is driving, it's an economic driver for you. So there's just a lot of benefits and more likely to be able to purchase homes, purchase property, um, go to one of the colleges, things like that. So are there any questions around the credit building? I know we've gone through um, a lot of information on credit in a short amount of time. So um, if there's any questions that you have today, I'm happy to answer those. Also, if there's any questions moving forward, um, I'm happy to give you my contact information and I'll, I can always take a call or an email if you've got a situation that, that you have a question about in regards to credit. I have a question and maybe just talk a little bit more about a good referral, right? We've talked a bit, you know, at a at an event, we'll be looking at reports and and coming up with action plans. But, you know, in general, thinking about um, people we're running across in this community, what is a good referral and how do we make the referral? Um, we are, uh, again, going to be hiring someone here, but we're working with Osby, so this would be the a good a good spot to send someone and then we'll work it out. Um, I think when we talk about referrals, I, I want to share one of my favorite stories. Um, you're all familiar with um, probably Global Entrepreneurial Week. Well, um, several years ago, a gentleman named Toby from Kansas City won Global Entrepreneurial Week for the whole world. He was the entrepreneur. Um, when Toby accepted that in Kansas City, there were 18 service organizations that could claim that they had touched Toby and his business in some way during that process. So it wasn't just a win for Toby and one business, but it was a win for the entire community um, that support entrepreneurs in Kansas City. And no one organization said, oh, that's our client. No, that's my client. Um, it was everyone's client. It was everyone's win. And I think that um, if, they're, if you're looking at, at the referrals, then it's not you're giving away a customer or a client by you're sharing another resource that's a support partner in their journey forward. Um, and so I, I think it's super important that you all establish early on how you want that referral process to work uh, so it goes smoothly and you don't lose anyone in the mix. Mm -hmm. 